My name is David Gray. I direct the Workforce and Family Program here. And on behalf of our program and our foundation, we were very glad to invite you and very glad you've come to join us for this discussion of and release of our paper, The Stress of Balancing Work and Family, the Impact on Parent and Child Health, and the Need for Workplace Flexibility. We have had a concern here at New America for a while about uh, some of the stress that families are feeling in terms of work-life balance, but also more broadly the area that Americans of a variety of ages, Generation Y, through uh, older Americans trying to work in a different way, but continuing the workforce and perhaps phasing uh, into retirement are facing in terms of the balance in their lives, but in particular in terms of families and the, uh, the juggler family, the families that are trapped between trying to care for themselves and their children and their uh, parents. And so we've worked with folks at Georgetown Law and the Sloan Network to try to work on the Hill on trying to create a consensus around areas of work-life balance and workplace flexibility. We've also worked with um, a project here in New America we're launching called The Next Social Contract, where we look at how the social contract of the 20th century, the relationship between workers and government, families and individuals and corporations is starting to break down. And what can we reinvent for the new 21st century that helps uh, provide some of the safety net and provide some of the support that, that workers and families need in a way that keeps the, con the country and the economy entrepreneurial? And we believe that work-life balance and family responsibility is one important factor of the social contract that we look at. And of course, we've worked with many of you. I see m many uh, familiar faces in this room. We've worked with many of you on the area of, of workplace flexibility and work-life balance as we try to find ways to move the country forward around uh, some consensus uh, around how do we help people balance their work and their family lives more. So we appreciate your taking the time both to uh, be here as we release this paper and also to dialogue with us a little bit, not just today but going forward, on how we can do a better job of helping reduce the stresses that family feel, families feel. Because as, as Kelleen and, and, and I and others worked on this paper, we've really had an eye towards the fact that there is a lot of uh, attention being paid to the area of, of work-life balance and there's a lot of rhetoric and there are a fair amount of studies and we've tried to put together uh, the best we can uh, a research paper which is pretty comprehensive, which tries to uh, cut through some of the rhetoric and, and tries to provide a resource for uh, both the research community and for advocates and for those who just care about work-life balance, frankly through footnotes and bibliographies as well as through uh, analysis and, and, and argument, um, something that can help you all as you do your work uh, in this important field. And so we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you even after today paper most of you have. It's available at the door and online. And today it looks at some of the real costs to the stress in terms of health which families feel. And that's an area that gets some attention, perhaps not as much in this, in this debate as we feel that it should. And that's why we've undertaken working at this, uh, on this paper. As we try to cut through that uh, rhetoric and try to cut through some of the studies and try to provide an analysis of really where are some of the most important areas of, of, of health costs to families and children and parents. We're very pleased at New America to have Kelly Kay as one of our uh, fellows. She's a very busy person. She directs research at the National Campaign to Prevent uh, Teen Pregnancy. She's been a fellow here at New America. She's worked at the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as done research at the Department of Labor, the Urban Institute, and Brookings, and has a very broad knowledge of uh, family formation and other important areas in terms of how families uh, do operate and how they can do even better and how the government can help support them. So at, here at New America, Kelleen, uh, among her other uh, activities in, in, in town and leadership on these initiatives, um, develops and promotes policies to strengthen the structure of American families. Kelleen's going to uh, take some time to, to walk us through a little bit of, of, of her uh, journey in this paper and her uh, some of the findings there and then we'll have some of your questions and um, again we thank you very much for joining us we look forward to uh, both today and, and to continuing the dialogue even past today and uh, with that uh, Kelleen Kay. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction and thanks so much for coming I'm really pleased to see you all here. This is obviously a topic we feel is is very important. And um, as David said, the paper that, that you have a copy of does look pretty intensely at the health consequences 
of what we're calling work-family conflict, although that's not actually where we started out. David and I started out pondering what we thought was a very simple question. As we see the labor hours of parents growing dramatically over the past several decades, is it logical or reasonable to assume that therefore parents must be spending a lot less time with their kids? Um, a year later, <laughs> we've come to the conclusion that that's actually not such a straightforward question, that the answer is actually probably different than what we expected, but that it may not even be the most important question to be asking. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today goes a little bit beyond this sort of simple accounting of how many p hours are parents spending at work and how many hours are parents spending at home. Uh, even though that tends to be the set of findings that gets highlighted in the press most often. We're going to talk a little bit about what we actually mean by work-family conflict, even though it seems like a very self-evident term and how extensive it is. Try to disentangle a few of these numbers around whether parents' time with kids has actually gone up or down, uh, and why we should even care. Uh, one could be tempted to just say, you know, so we're a little stressed out. So it's everybody and parents just need to figure out how to manage that a little bit better. Uh, also to, to take on this question of even if we do think this is a serious problem, maybe we shouldn't even focus on it because there's not really anything to be done about it. After all, there's only 24 hours in a day. Um, and finally to come to our answer, which we think is there are indeed targets of opportunity uh, to make both workers and their employers better off. So, I was kidding with a couple of my colleagues before we, start, before we started the presentation that perhaps all I should do is just ask everybody who's been stressed out this week to raise their hands and then say, okay, I've made my point and you can all go. <laughs> that would be a lot less stressful for me, probably. Um, but in fact, uh, what we want to do is dig a little bit deeper, like I said, into what we actually mean by work-family conflict. Uh, and again, because it's, it's such a self-evident kind of term and it's something that we all relate to so easily, the danger there is that it almost becomes easier to dismiss it as something that we should be focusing on. And so here are a couple more formal definitions related to work-family conflict. The first is talking about the fact that our obligations at work and at home are actually mutually incompatible, sort of suggesting that we have to choose one or the other. We really can't satisfy both of those sets of obligations. The second definition, while very related, makes some important distinctions. It talks more about the strain that we face when we try to meet both of those obligations and that it's a function of both the stresses on us and the supports that we may or may not receive from the community. So this really implies that, in fact, parents might be meeting both of those sets of obligations, uh, but it hints at the fact that it's coming at a price. And again, this is what's behind this notion of we can't just simply see whether parents are still spending enough time with their kids and say, okay, now we don't have to worry anymore. So, the origins of work-family conflict. This is going to come as a huge surprise to all of you, I'm sure. <laughs> no, not really. But between the 1970s and the current decade, there's just been explosive changes in the labor market participation of parents. We have, you know, a, both among single earners and among dual earners, uh, we have more hours spent in the workforce, and of course we have more dual earner families than we used to. And so you can see uh, among two parent families um, a, a much larger uh, number of work hours, and also among single parent families, um, you know, we're also seeing a, a, a growth in those that are employed versus unemployed. Uh, we see that the hours per single mother is more than double to 23 hours per week. And this is measured among all single mothers, so it includes those that aren't even working at all. Uh, 
and we also see that hours per two-parent family has risen about 23 percent to about 65 hours a week. And again, that includes families um, where there may be one or two earners. So it's kind of combining the fact that each parent is working more and we have more families where both parents are working. Again, this isn't rocket science. These are sort of basic statistics that you can pull down from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other places. Um, but it does certainly provide a pretty clear picture as to why we're all feeling so stressed out. So just what is happening uh, with respect to the time parents are spending with their kids. We hear a lot of different studies come out, uh, and they might seem to be very confusing at first blush. They seem to sort of point us in different directions about whether we should be worried about this or not. Uh, there was a landmark study that came out in 1999 by the Council of Economic Advisors. This is one of the studies that kind of first put this issue on the map. It said that there was a decrease of 22 hours per week uh, in parental time available for their kids since the 1960s. So that certainly got a lot of people's attention. Then we have more recent studies which are based on what we call um, time use surveys or time diary studies. Susan Bianchi and some of her colleagues have put out a lot of really, really good research on this. These kinds of data go out and poll parents as to exactly how they spend the hours in their day. Now this study, by contrast, said that even though the time that parents spent on child activities fell during the 1970s and 80s, in fact it rose during the 1990s and was now at a higher level than we've seen since the Ward and June Cleaver days of the 1960s. So, okay, now I'm a little confused as to whether or not I'm supposed to be worried about this. Now we have yet another study which said, well, actually during the 1990s, the time that each child got from their parents didn't go up dramatically. It stayed about the same. So there was no increase to offset that earlier deficit that we saw during the 60s and 70s and 80s. Hmm, now I'm really scratching my head. Finally, we have polling data that tell us that 70% 70 70 of working parents say that they spend insufficient time with their kids. So what is, a, and the, this is just a sample of the many, many different studies that are out there about parental time, about time with that parents and kids have together. So while they seem to lead you in different directions or even be inconsistent, what's really going on here is that they're all measuring different things. And they're all important questions, but again, they're not the same question. When we talk about that first study, what that study measured was time available for kids. And it's basically the residual of when you're not sleeping and you're not working, you're available for your kids. And it's not rocket science to figure out that yes, that's going down because we're working a lot more than we used to. And so uh, it didn't focus just on those child-centered activities, but rather is a parent generally in the house? Uh, doing whatever that parent may do while the child is also in the home. The second study looked at time that parents actually reported spending on child-centered activities. And so that's a little bit different outcome. And again, this is a study that said, well, it went up, it, it actually went down in the 70s and 80s, but then rebounded quite strongly in the 90s. The next study about time each child received the time that the child receives is not the same as the time that the child's, that the parent spends. And while that may sound counterintuitive, there are a couple of reasons for that. Studies that focus on time that parents spend looks at each parent. Said, okay, how much time did you spend with your child? How much time did you spend with your child? That doesn't take into account, because the measure is focused on the parent, doesn't take into account the fact that some households have one parent in the home some households have two parents in the home. And obviously now we have many, many more one-parent households than we used to. And so even though this study looked at, found that time that mothers spent with their kids went up and time that married fathers spent with their kids went up, when you look at the overall combined time that a child is receiving, it could still actually be going down or staying the same rather than going up. 
<coughs> and then finally, the last study is, again, one, one of many polling uh, sets of findings that talk about, you know, regardless of whether time is going up or down, do parents feel that they're spending enough time with their kids? Uh, and overwhelmingly, parents are deeply concerned about whether they're spending enough time with their kids. We feel that however much time we spend, it's not going to be enough. And that's because standards have really changed a lot over time. Uh, there is more pressure for children to participate in organized activities. There's more concern about child development. There's more concern about unsafe environments and unscheduled and unsupervised time. So all of that means that the bar is steadily rising against which parents are trying to measure their adequacy. So, and yet, after going through all of this to confuse you as much as possible, uh, it does seem that even across all these different studies, parental time with kids at the very least has not taken a huge hit. But as I alluded to earlier, that may not even really be the most important question. Because work-family conflict, or work strain as some people call it, is more a function of what price it's exacting on the parents and the children, even if the parents do still manage to meet these obligations. And so how is it that parents are managing to either spend just as much time with their kids, or at the very least, probably not decrease it in any real measurable way? Well, and I'll mention that this graph here focuses on mothers, and that's primarily because it's where we see the largest changes and also the group that we had the most consistent data for. It's not to say that father uh, time with children isn't important, and we have some figures on them, but I wouldn't have been able to give you as nice of a picture. So you can see from the red bar uh, that among working moms, personal care fell by about five hours a week. Smaller decrease for non-working moms, again looking at the red bar. Uh, but when we look across all moms, uh, it, it also, there was also you know, a, a reasonable decrease there. Free time uh, is shown by that sort of periwinkle or light blue bar. Uh, that's falling as well. Family time is uh, going up a little bit. And uh, then we see uh, work time going up a significant amount. And so even though among working moms, this particular set of data don't show a large increase in the number of hours they're working, when we go all the way over to the all moms category, that's when we see the fact that more moms are working. And so the average number of hours goes from 15 to 24 hours per week. So there are a number of other studies uh, that put out findings on sort of how parents are managing this time crunch and how their weekly schedules are sort of shaking out. Uh, and we've, there are findings, for example, that both mothers and fathers spent roughly 40% less time on personal activities uh, in 2000 and, 2002 compared to 1977. We find that while time spent on household tasks has shifted somewhat from mothers to fathers, so the dads are are picking up part of this. <laughs> Want to make a plug for the dads. Um, that total parental time on household chores has fallen by about eight hours per week or 20 percent. Uh, we're eating more meals out, contracting more for cleaning services, taking our clothes to the dry cleaners, um, you know, hiring housekeeping services. And that's all good and well, but the, a couple of the dangers there are is that, you know, those instances where it's leading to less healthy lifestyles and also the fact that not all households can avail themselves of those services. And so while for many households, you know, they just kind of accept it as a cost of, of the business of the week, of, of sort of making their household run on time, some families don't have that option. And they're the families that are really being squeezed here. Um, another set of findings that relates to how parents are managing to squeeze all this into the week is comes out in terms of the quality of time that we're spending uh, with our kids. That is the amount of multitasking that we're doing during that supposedly child-centered time. Uh, a couple of studies have found, for example, that 
uh, for example, the, the amount of time that parents spent multitasking, the, the percentage of their child-focused time that was actually multitasking time was about three quarters. And children notice this. They know that you're on your Blackberry or on your cell phone or editing a paper while you're supposed to be focusing uh, on them or helping them with dinner or uh, whatever. And the kids themselves are saying that, uh, you know, for example, only between half and only about half of their parents are really readily focused on them when they're spending time with their parents. Uh, the other half feel that their parents are very distracted uh, and very stressed out when they're together. And the number one wish that kids had isn't even for more time with their parents. It's for their parents to be less distracted and less stressed out. Um, so I think that's just a very, I think kids can be a great barometer of how things are going in the family and you know, to have these kinds of findings are, are quite telling. So, how common is work-family conflict? And one of the reasons why, once we realize that just the number of hours that parents are spending in the household perhaps isn't the most important question here, and that we really need to focus on work-family conflict, we then really try to get a better understanding of, well, how serious is this? Because again, if I asked all of you if you feel any conflict between your job and your family, almost everybody says yes. <laughs> Uh, it's almost impossible not to, and there's plenty of polling results out here that show exceedingly high levels. Um, you know, there was a Monster.com survey reported on MSNBC. 81% of workers said that they were unhappy with their work-life balance. Um, other polling data: 63% talk about job inter job pressures interfering with life. And again, you can find a hundred other results that are similar, and yet it's challenging to present those results in a fully compelling way. And again, part of that is because once something becomes so universal, we almost sort of throw up our hands and just say, well, that's life and we just need to accept it. And the very notion of measuring stress or conflict is such an inherently subjective outcome that it becomes harder for the policy community, I think, to take it as seriously as we would hope. And so what our goal then was to find some outcomes that were maybe a little bit more concrete, a little bit harder hitting, to gauge our level of concern over this. And without intending to go down the health consequences path, that was just where almost all of the studies led us. And I was quite surprised at just how much evidence there is out there in the medical community about these kinds of outcomes. And again, this is one of the goals that our research has, is to try to bring together, pull in those kinds of results for folks over in sort of the work and family communities uh, and the workplace flexibility communities and, and some of these other folks that are looking at these issues to point them over to some of these other scientific studies as well. So, and again, we have just a sampling of results. Uh, those reporting work-family conflict were two and a half times more likely to suffer from clinically defined anxiety, twice as likely to suffer from substance abuse. This isn't just polling data. This is a study uh, that CDC put out on comorbidity outcomes. Uh, the data were very rigorously collected, and the definitions of the clinical outcomes that we're talking about were based on, you know, sort of highly validated international standards of how to diagnose these different outcomes. And that'll be sort of the running theme throughout all of these studies. We, like I said, we really tried to sort of get to the most scientific evidence that we could. Uh, those reporting family-to-work conflict were 30 times as likely to suffer from a mood disorder and 10 times as likely to suffer from substance abuse. So the first result talks about work-to-family conflict where your job is interfering with your family obligations. That's stressful. Second one is talking about family-to-work conflict where your family obligations are intruding into your ability to do your job. That seems even more stressful, apparently. And I'm guessing that's because many times your work obligations uh, are, just, are just more intractable, less flexible. Uh, we have some other studies, one by the London School of Medicine, found that work-family conflict raises the risk of metabolic syndrome by 1.5 times 
for men and two times for women. Metabolic syndrome is sort of a cluster of uh, uh, biological symptoms that put you at greater risk for uh, coronary disease, diabetes, and a number of other really serious outcomes. These studies were, uh, had rigorous scientific controls. They controlled statistically for a whole host of other sociodemographic characteristics that might also be affecting these outcomes. They also actually controlled for other health behaviors. And so in addition to the fact that your work conflict might lead you to less healthy behaviors, even netting that out, it affected a person's basic biology in unhealthy ways. That's a little bit of an extreme measure, but again, I think it points to the fact that this is not just, oh, I had a bad day at the office. This is something that we really need to start paying attention to. Uh, parental reported work family conflict had significant impacts on dietary habits, body mass index, and the risk of obesity. And again, not surprising, but the fact that we have very rigorous empirical evidence on this is something that the community, that the policy community, needs to be pulling into their arguments oops, and taking advantage of. It's one thing to say that a result is statistically significant, but how big is it? Is it that big or is it that big? Well, the study that the USDA put out on the impact on childhood obesity found that if a parent reported uh, work-family conflict or job stress, it was enough to move a child from the normal category all the way into the at-risk category. So we're not just talking about a couple point difference here. It was a measurable increase in their risk for being obese. These kinds of, you know, it's always good to run this stuff through just kind of an intuitive, an intuitive test also. And these outcomes, these studies, are very much in line with what we see just by looking at general trends. You know, since the 1970s, the share of meals eaten out by families has more than tripled. Uh, per capita consumption of fats increased by 38%. Consumption of sugars by 20%. Only 42% of adolescents ate meals with their parents six to seven days a week. And one third ate meals with their parents three days a week or less. And so again, this is just further evidence that the, the sort of fabric of the family is deteriorating in some important ways that has consequences for the kids. There's other, other studies out there that look at uh, levels of stress in the kids and finding an enormous association between the parents' stress when they walk in the door and how that gets directly transferred to the child the minute they come home. And then linking that further to behavioral problems in kids. And I could go on and on and on. <laughs> the paper does, so take a look at it. Um, more than just a family matter. You know, what, what we wanted to make clear here is that someone could easily say, again, yeah, I know you're stressed, I get it. But that's just part of what it's like to be a family today, and parents just need to manage that. They just need to deal with it. And why should non-parents or society at large or the government or the policy community really care about this? What's at stake for the larger good of our society? And this is where we tie into a little bit of the social contract work that David was talking about. You know, families are the building block of our next generation and our coming society. And whether that society is prepared to sort of take on the reins of, of a democracy, of an equitable and well-functioning government and society. Just a couple of quotes here that I thought were um, really telling. Caring for each other is the most basic form of civic participation, and we learn how to do that first and foremost within families. So parents are the very first and most basic instructors of how to teach children to participate in their society in a meaningful and caring way. Caring is the essential democratic act, the prerequisite to voting and all of the other things that we feel are essential to maintaining uh, and, and, uh, and it, it, the, the government as we hope it will function. The second quote, political society is always regarded as a scheme of social cooperation over time indefinitely. This is a basic notion that you need a subsequent generation to perpetuate the society that we're trying to build. Parents are the ones that produce that second generation. 
um, the family must ensure the nurturing and development of such citizens in appropriate numbers to maintain an enduring society. So again, without if, if parents are unable to provide that environment that will nurture the future leaders, of, it sounds very cliche and very basic, but it nonetheless it's true. Uh, if parents are unable to fulfill that role, then things will start to break down in very important ways. Okay, so uh, the other issue is, you know, the other reason why people could just sort of tune all this out is to say, yeah, okay, you sold me, this is important, but I still don't think there's anything we can do about it. We can't very well add hours to the day. And, you know, some people would, would, would very easily say we can't very well just impose lots of new mandates on employers. They're not going to go for that, and that's not going to go anywhere. Uh, but what I wanted to point out is that, in fact, both parents and employers are paying a cost just for maintaining the status quo. Um, you know, the amount of, un there are, there's a lot of evidence out there from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and some other private firms that the amount of unscheduled absences are adding up to millions and millions of dollars in costs uh, to employers, not just because of lost work time, but because those unscheduled absences tend to come up very much at the last minute and harm productivity in a much larger way than one would think just from the net cost of those hours in the day. <clears throat> in fact, uh, it's account right now it's estimated as $284 for every single worker in the workforce in terms of cost to employers. And work-family conflict, as I think, what, what the point that we're getting to is that work-family conflict isn't just because parents don't have enough hours. Uh, what those studies before were really highlighting, and even what the polling data of parents suggest, is that parents aren't looking to work less. They're just looking for greater flexibility and greater control over their schedules. That seems to be the driving force behind many of the negative outcomes that we're looking at. And we have a number of promising pilot, pilot studies that show that there are very basic practical things that employers can do to grant some of that flexibility in a way that not only helps the workers, but actually improves the bottom line of the employers. Uh, it reduces their rates of unscheduled absence, uh, rates of tardiness, and the rates of, um, you know, sort of unplanned for overtime that they end up paying. And while many people in higher income jobs tend to enjoy some of these flexible measures already, one could say, well, I know, but that's never going to translate to the low wage labor market. In fact, a lot of these employers are hiring large number of lower wage workers and finding that these strategies have been really helpful. Just a couple of these examples of what those strategies might look like, because I think making it more concrete is always helpful. Um, you know, having more cross-training, working out schedules uh, with more lead time, having a pool of, you know, flexible workers that are cross-trained and always looking to take on more hours that you can draw on. Overscheduling uh, a shift by 15% in case somebody drops out. And if somebody doesn't drop out, then you'll have sort of a, a pool of volunteers that are always looking to work fewer hours. You know, there are, are again, very practical ways, even some of them technology-driven, that could benefit both the worker and the employer. So just some of the things in terms of next steps. Um, I think we obviously need a lot more dialogue on work-family conflict. We need to have more communication uh, between the policy communities, the labor communities, the employer communities, so that we're all getting a better understanding of how serious these consequences are. And again, that this isn't something we should just dismiss as having a bad day at the office. Uh, but we also need a much greater understanding of what the employer concerns are, uh, both with respect to the status quo and with respect to any changes that might be getting bantered about. We have some preliminary thoughts from the employers, uh, but we need to dig deeper and get a better understanding of that. We also need to learn a lot more about the potential of some of these workplace flexibility policies. Uh, we need a lot more case studies about how these policies are being implemented, 
what some of the challenges have been associated with that and what some of the successful strategies have been. And we need more evaluations, I mean rigorous hardcore evaluations that show what the impacts have been on employer related outcomes and on worker related outcomes. Uh, and finally, I would suggest you know, that there may be opportunities to learn from the biggest employer out there, and that's the federal government. And most of them are right here locally. <laughs> uh, right now, the federal government is ignoring, uh, or largely ignoring, the mandate for more flexible work schedules. And that's a real learning opportunity. There are obviously some deep-seated concerns behind that, and we need to take a closer look. Again, we've done a little bit on that, but we need to do more. Um, we need to better document uh, what some of the barriers are. We need to study some instances where it has been implemented and where it's been found to be helpful. Uh, with that, we can take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I suggest that you follow your first instinct and put the child back in the box. I think that the your concern about the impact of of the absence uh, of the parent is very important. And I think it's not just available to the parent when he or she is not sleeping or working, it's what is the time, what is the stimulating time, the time when the parent stimulates the child and the child stimulates the parent. And the question to, to ask is uh, if the parents reduce the time and quality of this stimulation factor, uh, is the parent actually harming the development of the child's brain? And mm -hmm. I would bring into, I mean, you were talking about the need to bring different disciplines. I would bring a psychologist, I would bring a, a neurobiologist in this, because they all have things to say, but they never talk to each other. They have no collegiate uh, environment whatsoever. And I would like to give you one example. The, uh, for instance, um, there is a, a pediatrician called Kisiakis in Seattle who uh, has uh, this to say. I mean, well, let me first mention this uh, television as a substitute parent. Yes. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a, lot of, a lack of research on the role of parents, but the Kaiser Family Foundation has plenty of statistics on the role of the television set. 30% of American toddlers, 30%, have television sets in their bedroom. And yet 60% of the parents say they're very concerned about the effect of television on their children. So there we have uh, some hard statistics. Yep. Of course, 98% of homes have television. Here's what the pediatrician Pustaki says. He says, uh, that uh, he, he made a study where he found a causal link, a causal link uh, between uh, viewing the television medium, he says medium and not content, and ADHD. In other words, an impact uh, between the viewing the TV medium and the brain. And he, uh, he says uh, this study proves that it does not matter what children watch that the use, of the, the use of the medium of television itself should be a concern to parents, even if children are watching so-called education television. And this is when parents say, we are with the child who is watching educational television. The negative effect of TV viewing can still impact the brain. This is a pediatrician and a neurobiologist, Wexler, in his book Brain and Culture, says that Sensory stimulation is necessary if the brain is to develop normally. The, the uh, link to the environment, and here we are talking about parents as the environment, is essential rather than elective. So uh, th this is the, uh, uh, the parent using television as a substitute nurturer there. And the question is, is this having an effect on the brain of our child, which is now in full development, but well, we do have some statistics that show it may be. Right, there, there is. I mean, you're absolutely right. And Let me just give you one more example. And one example of this is the literacy problem. We, uh, our public school system has observed a decline in reading proficiency starting with grade five. 
And what is startling is that its decline is for all groups, all socioeconomic groups. So we all should be looking for the common factor. And is the common factor the absence of a nurturing parent? I think that there are, you're absolutely right to raise these very troubling results. There is a quite robust literature, as you suggest, on the deficits uh, in child development that result when they don't have enough time with their parents and when other things like television become a substitute. And we couldn't be concerned more about that. Where the common link is, is, you know, we certainly would hypothesize quite strongly that the fact that you know, work hours have become so much more prominent is a factor in that. What we would really like to see are some studies that tie those two things together more directly. Like I said, work-family conflict or number of hours at work with some of the adverse child outcomes that you were noting. Right now, the literature, the field, just isn't quite there yet. I look pretty extensively tying into those kinds of studies, and I hope, I really hope to see some more development but that along those lines. Is indicative because the, uh, the research on content, TV content, is fully funded by the television industry because right. they have, they have uh, filters to offer, but nobody is doing any work on the, on the medium itself. Right. Okay, let's have the next question. Um, do you know if there's an increase or a decrease or There are a number of different statistics on that. I'm not going to be very good at quoting them right now. One, one statistic that does come to mind, though, that's related to your question is the fact that a very large share of parents, I, I'm going to guess and say it's maybe 30 to 40 percent, are working more hours than they want to be working. And that the reason why they're working those extra hours isn't just because they want more money. A, good, a very sizable share of those parents are saying that they have to work those hours in order to keep their job. And the same thing goes for shift work. There's a huge number of parents working shift work, and again, it's not just because, oh, I get paid more on that shift. Because then, of course, you could say, well, you have to make a choice. It's that they're really required to do so. And so I think part-time work or splitting shifts, those kinds of strategies are not sufficiently available to parents. If I, if I could just yeah. add on that, you know, one thing I think that's going to be interesting to see happen after the next election, actually, in terms of the healthcare debate, and it's actually one thing that our social contract project is, is very focused on, is the number of, parent, of, of families who are in a full-time job strictly for the benefits, and um, that there's a demand for part-time work which is not able to uh, multiply fruitfully because people are, are feel wedded to their job for benefits. So if we do move to a portable universal health care in some way in 2009, let's say, it'll be interesting to see if there's an increase in, uh, in part-time work because I think anecdotally, and I think there, uh, there, there seems to be a, uh, enough social science literature indicating that people will you know, have the conflict of, being, of wanting to have part-time work but have full-time benefits and it just, it just doesn't work, that when you have portable universal health care, and potentially pensions, you're going to get an increase in the, in the number of people who are working part time. There's a question over here. Yeah. Oh, um, I was wondering what kind of differences um, you had seen if there's any data out there between stress level people who work for smaller businesses versus these large corporations that are, you know, they there's more of a demand for them to offer that flexibility, mm -hmm. and they have a, more opportunity to offer flexibility. Than Unfortunately not. I think that is such an important distinction, and, and you're right, it's likely going to be a real source of difficulty overcoming that, you know, trying to find that kind of balance within smaller companies, just like trying to have better balance with benefits and everything else. The data aren't broken out that way. I think probably just because of small sample sizes in the survey, we really don't even have it broken out very well by socioeconomic status, which is a shame, at least the, the studies that are out there so far. So we need to push the envelope a lot in terms of I mean, and that's actually, I'm, I'm so, you're, you're reminding me of another important point, is that even if we see an average, you know, on average, some indicator looks like it's doing better than it was before, like hours with kids, 
within that average, there's going to be a whole range of some families that are doing better and some families that are doing worse. And we don't get to look at that distribution right now, and I think it would be really important to do so, either by size of business, by socioeconomic status, by service sector, all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, Chris, thank you very much for the study. I think it's, it's a very good resource. Great. Um, my question is uh, your last remark about the federal government. Um, and I totally agree with you that this should offer a lot of scope for more studies partly because in my knowledge they have done much more in offering flexibility, yep. but you seem to be much more kind of some have, some happen and they could do much more, so. Right. Well, and you know, and you're right, I, I think that I should have qualified that statement a bit. Within individual offices, I think, sort of at, especially maybe more at the informal level between supervi direct supervisors and their employees, you know, there, there will be some leeway and some allowances. The government is great for offering paid leave off and, and other benefits. Uh, but even in terms of flex time and, uh, you know, work at home kinds of arrangements, uh, the government is not even close to living up to the mandate that Congress imposed on it in terms of letting, you know, telecommuting and flex time schedules. So that right there could make a big difference. Um, and I think the reasons why government uh, offices are not implementing even just those two practices would probably shed light more generally on employers' concerns about flexible workplace, workplace policies. Yeah, just um, I was interested in the application of maybe a cyclical relationship between uh, increased multitasking time and how stress is created by that. Uh, for instance, if a working family, mother, father, uh, is multitasking at home, doing the laundry, and you know, out of the corner of their eye, watching their kid who's watching television. Um, so maybe they're, they're trying to accomplish whatever it is they're trying to accomplish within the home. They're not able to take the kid outside because, especially with young kids, they need supervision. So in, then inherently, they're forced into like a wedge where they're not able to experience just one-on-one -on -one time or uh, non-household time or um, uh, freedom time. I don't know. How downtime? That. Yeah, real actual downtime away from distraction of chores and then on top of that how the because because of multitasking and, and that sort of thing there's there's less um, there's less opportunities for home cooking um, yep. you know, lunch, lunch boxing instead of lunchables yep. and so you get more pollution and more uh, neglect on your environment on a whole so that has to have some sort of special relationship but I'm, I'm just curious if I'm sure there's, a, in addition to the negative results that I presented here, I'm sure that there's huge uh, potential for even further kind of negative multiplier effects like you're pointing out. We don't have any good data on it. Um, if you do a study on it, let me know. I'd love to see the results. Um, but definitely quality of time with the kids is surfacing even in some of the most basic indicators that we're looking at as, as a source of concern and dietary quality. Like I said, hitting McDonald's on the way home from work is is constituting dinner more and more. Yeah, I guess I'm interested in a little bit of a framing question about you know how do you talk about this and have it be about how the workplace needs to change and societal choices as opposed to it's all those working mothers' fault, which is I think how this often gets framed. Yeah, that's a great question and a really big challenge, and I think part of it is. Um, you know, pointing out that there are costs to employers as well, that we're not just asking for a big gimme for parents. Uh, there are costs to society as well, and, you know, making that really clear. Um, but also pointing out that, you know, th these, are the, these are the trends in society, and we're not going to go backwards. We're not going to reverse that. Um, you know, this is the current societal structure that we're in, and we have to find a way that makes that makes it work for all sides. But you're right, there is a tendency to just say, you know what, this is because moms are going in the workforce and they need to stop doing that. 
And the other thing that I think is helpful on this, as I said at the beginning, is to talk broad, more broadly about than families, about Gen Y, and particularly older workers who have the same desire for flexibility because they want to work in a different way. And that huge baby boom retirement is this huge advocacy potential for the kind of changes that would benefit women and others in the workforce. Shelley? Um, I use this argument to relieve my own personal guilt. I'm a parent, so I'm curious of the research facts and stuff. But I, I find it interesting when we look over time about parental time with kids that, that also our notion of what's good for kids developmentally has changed. And if you talk to somebody like my mother, um, putting a child in a playpen and letting them play independently while she was cooking, cleaning, what have you, was actually pretty not good and common developmental policy. Now, I think we have a bit of over-parenting, or at least there's some notion about mm -hmm. over-parenting or the helicopter parents, right. you know, some of the media terms that have come to that, where this really intense one-on-one, -on -one, no multitasking, no distraction, completely child-focused is sort of what you need in order to make sure that your child gets the outcome for. And I wonder if anybody's actually tried to track some of those develop child development um, philosophy changes and how much that's both contributed to the work family conflict and that stress. Um, because I think, as you're noting, that it's, it's the, the stress is actually part of the problem. So if, if there's a way to sort of realign our expectations or understand better what is appropriate child developmental practice, what does that look like, and how do we do comparative um, time analysis when those things have really changed significantly in the last 20 years? Yeah, the whole context, the whole environment that we're measuring these things in is not constant. And the bar that we're trying, the bar that we're attaining and stressing out over may not be the right bar. It may, maybe that bar is set too high. Um, that, 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 that's a tough one. I haven't tapped into that line of research myself. I think that there are pieces of the there are pieces uh, to that puzzle. We have sort of child development literature and time with kids literature and brain development literature and media literature, um, tying it all together and drawing out that implication for okay, how much time do parents need to spend with their kids and what does that mean for workplace policy? We haven't quite tied that knot yet. Um, we'll keep working on it. Let's take one last question, and then we can continue the dialogue afterwards informally. Did you have one, sir? Sure. You mentioned um, family outsourcing, a lot of household chores, cooking, etc. Do you want to know about the amount of money families on average are spending on that, and then do you go beyond that, the size of that entire sector of the economy and activities that, you know, 25 years ago were run by women and not part of economic calculation, the GDP, et cetera, and it's now you know, I was very curious about that exact same question, and I started tracking it. There are um, consumer expenditure surveys, and I started trying to track, you know, just how much uh, f individuals and families, families with kids, are spending on those kinds of home service uh, remedies. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to bring it to a real solid conclusion because the way that things are measured, there are some real serious inconsistencies in the data over time that that just didn't quite give me the reliable results that I needed. I'm going to, I'll keep looking and see if we can pin it down a little better, because I think it's a big question. Intuitively, we would think that we're spending a whole lot more than we were in the past. Uh, but again, the data, uh, because there were some really big changes in how those categories are defined, can't get us the answer. I have two resources. Shelley probably knows the answer to part of this. But this book, The Empty Cradle, which is framed right over here, has a, has a chapter that gets into some of that, actually, if you want to get into Phil Longman's book. But, that's uh, all the time. I want to respect your time. I appreciate you guys coming. I want to continue to ask for your feedback on this paper before Absolutely. we send it out to the whole world. We wanted to you know, get some feedback from you all here. And to tie two things together, we're going to have two events in the next two weeks, which are on, on part of the things that you guys have asked questions on. One is on the missing class on October 1st here, which is going to uh, target the people, those making between twenty and $40,000 a year. And what do we know and what policies should be doing to, to help what we, we think is sort of uh, an underappreciated uh, social policy issue, and then bring these health consequences uh, to a new population of obesity, which is also something that Kelly focuses on in the paper. October 4th, Senators Murkowski and Harkin are, uh, are co-sponsoring an event that we are doing in um, Senate Capitol uh, Room 4 on childhood obesity, and we're going to have the State uh, Health Commissioner of New Jersey and health officials from a variety of states, as well as local officials, uh, talking about childhood obesity that, that morning of the 4th. So that week of October 1st, two 
uh, events our program's having uh, related to the social contract and related to uh, the well-being of families. And we hope uh, that you can join us for those. And we thank you for coming today. Thanks so, again. Thank you.